we're going to go off into the woods where it's more undisturbed, where there hasn't been a lot of trampling taking place, and find a nice site. Here's a good spot uh, between some trees where we don't think people have been walking. So we're going to get a little bit more natural view of these top few centimeters, the upper horizons, which was kind of hard to see in the soil pit because so many people have been walking around. They've been trampled and it lost its leaf cover. So the first thing you notice about this forested area, uh, this is certainly not a, a virgin forest by any means. It's regrowth on old agricultural land. Uh, but these trees have been around a while. Uh, the biggest of them were actually blown over in a tornado about 20 years ago. <coughs> but uh, they've certainly been around for close to a century. And so we're getting back to a more natural condition as you'd find it under a forest. And you can see that you don't see any soil. Nature very rarely wants you to see the soil. Uh, this is what protects the soil, is that it has this cushion of leaves which absorbs the impact of raindrops and so the erosion rate on a, on a site like this is uh, very close to zero, certainly uh, in human lifetimes. So we're going to examine this. I'm going to move a few of the bigger chunks away. Uh, there's some controversy as to whether you consider that part of the soil or not. It's part of the lit litter or the O-horizon. I guess anything lying on the ground is part of the O-horizon. So I'm going to just dig a shallow hole here so that we can look at these layers and cut through it. And we can learn not only about the soil, but we'll learn about what makes a forest ecosystem tick. A lot of that is wrapped up in the soil. Okay, so here's kind of a little mini profile of the upper part of the soil. You kind of recognize these colors? It's what we saw in the pit. But now we're getting a much better view of this upper part. Let me get my knife out. So we have this loose leaf litter, which is a soil horizon. That's one of the O horizons. Okay, this is the O I horizon. That is, it's incompletely decomposed. It's just starting to decompose. Some of these leaves are only you know, four or five months old from last fall. This is near the end of March, so these probably fell in October. Uh, some of these leaves are probably from a few years ago, so they're uh, partially decomposed. They've been chewed up. That's quite important. And uh, they're often attacked under these conditions by, by fungi first. So we have a second layer, which looks kind of like this. And this is the partially decomposed uh, organic material, where for the most part you can't really see what these material was. You can see some bits of fibers, uh, little bits of leaf, but it's starting to look kind of like compost. Mm, it smells very nice, very earthy. That earthy smell comes from the actinobacter or actinomycetes, which produce uh, some aromatic compounds as they decompose the leaves. Okay, let's take a closer look at this. We'll kind of cut through this a little bit. Oh, that was... This is contamination from my knife. Here's the really decomposed material. And this you can see is pretty amorphous. This is what we would call humus. It's been decomposing for probably decades and centuries. And it uh, really can't see what that started out anymore. So this is the third horizon. And these O horizons then are probably a few centimeters of leaves, about a centimeter of the partially decomposed material, and maybe a centimeter or two of the highly decomposed material before we get into the A horizon. So the A horizon is this dark material that's high in organic matter, but this is mostly sand, silt, and clay with five or ten percent organic matter at the most whereas the black horizon above it is probably 70 or 80 percent organic matter with just a few sand grains in it.
think you can see the difference in color quite dramatically there. This is mineral enriched in organic matter. This is almost all organic matter. So this is a very important part of a forested ecosystem and the natural condition of this soil that you wouldn't find under most agricultural conditions, but you might begin to find even in city lawns where the grass uh, will start to create this. Now, if we start to pick this apart, we've got a fairly large tree over here. I'm not sure what it is. This is a beach, so there's some beaches here, some maples, a few oaks. You can see that there's a real, shake this up a little bit, shake some of the soil off of it, a real network of roots right at the soil surface, right where the leaves are decomposing, right below that is where all these tree roots are. And this is really where the biology in this forest system is taking place. Most of the nutrients are being cycled right here in these feeder roots. Now the tree roots go deep to get water and to anchor the tree, but most of the nutrients they're getting are coming right here, except maybe the calcium might be coming from deeper down. These roots are often infected with fungi, so this is a very fungal kind of environment. Uh, a little bit later, when it warms up, we'll probably see mushrooms coming up, which are the fruiting body of the, of, of the fungi. There, don't see any today. But the tree roots are usually not, especially these species, they're usually not uh, living by themselves in the soil, but they're living in symbiosis with these fungi, which we can't see. They're they're uh, microscopic and tend to break off, but they're a great expansion of the tree roots. And they actually, in recent years, we've learned that they not only expand an individual tree's roots, but they connect one tree to another. So that the uh, chemical signals, trees can talk to each other through the signals going through this hyphal networks, through these fine networks of roots. And uh, the trees can also talk to the organisms in the soil by emitting chemicals. Here you can see the, the mineral layer that's really quite dark because uh, it's enriched in organic matter. And this top part of this, the soil may have as much carbon in it, and that's very important these days, as all the trees on this site. Okay, this, this is quite rich in carbon. And this is very important from a climate change point of view because one of the benefits of a forest is that it takes carbon out of the air and it stores it both in the tree, in the wood, until the tree dies, or we put it in the building, and in the soil. But in most of these ecosystems, there's quite a bit more stored in the soil than in the trees. And we're just beginning to give that credit to that in terms of ways to mitigate climate change. So you can see we have this intense soil network right at the surface where everything's decomposing. It's highly fungal and it's occupied by you know, millions, whole mat of tree roots. And this is something to remember now whenever you see a forest, it, in most cases, this is where most of the nutrient cycling is taking place. Let's see if we can Yeah, we, uh, one, one concept that we'll learn about a little later is the concept of the soil that's very close to the roots. Often it's clinging to the roots. And we call that soil, most of this soil is going to be rhizosphere soil because there's so many roots in it. The rhizosphere is this zone around the living root that is greatly influenced by the root and influences the root. So this, this soil, this sort of clinging to the roots like this would be rhizosphere soil. I think I can see some mycorrhizal. Let me bring it close to the camera. Uh, uh, if we, if you can see where these fine roots against my hand are very kind of stubby and Y-shaped, I think that those are some ectomycorrhizal uh, 
bodies. So most of the mycorrhiza live in the roots and are microscopic, but uh, for pine trees and for a number of tree species, they also form, or they form uh, ectomycorrhiza, which the evidence of which is visible on the root. Uh, this is not the best example of that. Okay, so that was uh, a lot of what I wanted to show. Now, if we had a lot of patience, even though it's pretty cold, we should find things crawling around in the soil. Uh, this is an ant crawling around in here. Uh, they're pretty obvious. So there's lots of signs of life in this upper part of the soil, including, let's see if I can see some fungal activity here. So here's a twig, and you can see all of this fungi coming and growing out of the twig. It's decomposing this twig and turning it back into soil. Uh, in many cases, it's a little cold, so that they're kind of hibernating or estivating for the winter. There's some more fungal activity. So undisturbed acid forest soils tend to be dominated by fungi. If we were in an arid region with high pH soil in the desert, uh, it might have more bacterial activity and less fungi, but this is full of fungal activity. And if we're very patient, we can sometimes see little tiny creatures crawling around. But I'm not sure we want to spend 10 minutes looking at one handful of soil right now before they come into focus. But I've often had the experience, it's kind of a Zen experience, of sitting in the woods looking at the handful of soil. And just focusing on it. And pretty soon you start to see things moving little tiny white creatures wiggling around, hopping around like springtails. Uh, and I'm sure if we spent some time we'd see it. It's not, they're, they're so small that you usually can't see it until you've sat there for a while. But if we measure what's actually in this soil, in all likelihood there are this handful of soil, there are probably hundreds of nematodes. Uh, dozens to hundreds of mites, maybe a, you know, a handful this big, a few thousand mites in Columbia, and of course billions and trillions of bacteria, fungi, microorganisms. But we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I wanted to be sure you got a chance to see this very biologically active upper part of the soil uh, before we leave the soil pit for the day. Okay. Cover it up with some leaves. Let nature take its course.